each of the three messages have certain characteristics associated with them. And every reform movement possesses these characteristics. And when it comes to the third test, one of the characteristics of the third test is that there's a closing of the door. The, f the first test, the first message, has to do with a reformer and a reform message. Um, the second test has to do with the rejection of that message. And then the third test has to do with judgment. Um, but Noah brought a reform message. Um, it was resisted. And the third way mark in Noah's time period was when the door was closed. Um, as you bring these different prophetic lines together, you can see that it's at the third way mark that the door closes. Um, the door closed in Egypt. Moses was the reformer. Pharaoh offered the resistance to that time. And on the third test in Moses' time period, you have the judgment on the firstborn when the door closed on ancient Egypt. Um, in the Millerite history, the door into the holy place closed at the same point that the door in the parable of the ten virgins closed. And when you bring all these together, you identify that at the end of the world there will be a door that closes on Adventism. And it's, in, it's illustrated more, most often in the writings of Ellen White in connection with the parable of the ten virgins. And Sister White tells us more than once, as she's dealing with the parable of the ten virgins, that character is never demonstrated in a crisis. Character is, only, character is never developed in a crisis. It is only de demonstrated in a crisis. And when the Sunday law arrives and the door closes on Seventh-day Adventists, we will demonstrate the character that we have de developed in our prior hours of probation. Okay, that's, and, no more, and this is really a hard concept. This is a concept that is fought against in Adventism. There are many in Adventism that think this is just dark heresy. All right? But, I mean, come on. When the Sunday law arrives as a Sabbath keeper, do I get to keep Sunday that first weekend just so I can settle into the new state of things? Because if I get to keep it on that first Sunday, if I get to keep it for one week, then I guess I get to keep it for a month. I guess I get to keep it for a year. I guess I can go ahead and just keep Sunday to keep myself out of trouble and it really doesn't matter. When the Sunday law arrives, Seventh-day Adventists have to keep the Sabbath. And if they don't, they receive the mark of the beast. They're just That's where the door closes. All right? That's where we demonstrate our character. It's at the third test. That's where the door closed on the Millerites. Okay? When the prophets become part of the prophecy, they're illustrating God's people at the end of the world. If you take your concordance sometime and look up the word, word watchman, you'll find that there is a specific theme about the watchman in Bible prophecy. Um, it was the watchmen that were used to produce these two charts. All right, if In Habakkuk, Habakkuk 2 verse 1 it says, I will stand on my watch and see what uh, the Lord tells me. All right, He's, he's a watchman there. And uh, we want to look at it in a story of a, the, a watchman and when a prophet becomes part of the prophecy or when the subject of the watchman is being addressed in Bible prophecy it's talking about the watchman of Millerite history and the watchman at the end of the world. And remember in Jeremiah six seventeen that the Lord raises up watchmen that give a message of the trumpet but in the Adventist church there's a group of people that says we will not hearken to the sound of the trumpet message that the watchman gives. So the watchman is a subject of Bible prophecy. And one of the places that you'll find the story of the watchman is in Isaiah 21 and 22. And if you understand that the watchman, because they are illustrating the end of the world, have to be illustrating God's people at the end of the world, then they're illustrating the Millerites and the 144,000. So I have in your notes Isaiah 21 and 22 with some comments, and we're going to walk through that and see if we can come to grips with what it means. And a burden, Isaiah 21 is the burden of the desert and a burden is a tribute and utterance, a doom, a prophecy. It's a serious prophecy. First verse 1 of Isaiah 21 is letting us know that this is a serious prophecy and it says this. The burden of the desert of the sea to roar as whirlwinds in the south pass through so it cometh from the desert. Desert is the symbol of Islam. That's where Islam come from. This is a prophecy about the desert. Okay. 
from a terrible land. This is, this is a, a, a prophecy of doom. This is a serious prophecy about the desert. A terrible land. A grievous vision is declared to me. A grievous, terrible, hard vision. The treacherous dealeth, dealer dealeth treacherously and the spoiler spoileth. Now the, this dealer, to, it means to act con convertly, to pillage, to deal deceitfully. Uh -huh. You know, that's where, where the, the terminology assassin comes from. This is, a, this is someone that does his dirty work when you're not looking. Okay? And this is, this is a characteristic of Islam in Bible prophecy and in history and in their activities today. Next verse says, Go up, Elam, besiege. Besiege is talking about warfare. O media, all the sighing thereof I made to cease. Elam means hidden, veil from sight, to conceal, hide, secret thing. This is about a hard prophecy of doom, about warfare, and about warfare that's accomplished discreetly behind the scenes. You'll notice some Definitions here. Assassin. One who murders by surprise attack, especially one who carries out a plot to kill a prominent person. A member of a secret order of Muslims who terrorized and killed Christian crusaders and others. This is, just, this is the historical fact of Islam. Active in Persia and Syria from the 8th to 14th centuries. The uh, original assassins were members of the Nizaris, a Muslim group who opposed the Abbasid Caliphate with threats of sudden assassination by their secret agents. Marco Polo tells a tale of how young assassins were given a potion. And that potion was what? Hashish. That's, that's what we call it today. That's where the word assassin comes from. It's, it's from hashish. Assassin. That's the root word of assassin. Hashish. Marco Polo tells a tale of how the young assassins were given a potion and made to yearn for paradise, their war reward for dying in action by being given a life of pressure. As the legend spreads, the word assassin passed through French or Italian appeared in the English as assassin in the 16th century already with the meanings like treacherous killer. So, Isaiah 21 is a, is a hard vision from the desert about war. Let's continue on down through and see if it has anything to say about Islam. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. How many of the sisters in here have had a baby? It, it, I can only understand it by faith. But from what I understand, those pangs get worse and worse and closer and closer together, right? Okay. This is what's happening on planet Earth. Okay. Some, of, some, some people look at this presentation on the role of Islam in Bible prophecy and they see 9-11 and, and they settle into it. They can accept that. They, they see it. But they forget that the testimony of the prophecy is that it escalates. They're being restrained. But it's still, they start slipping through the angels' hands. Islam isn't finished. It's going to bring the world to its knees. If it stopped now, it wouldn't fulfill prophecy. It doesn't stop. It brings the world to its, to its knees. Like a woman that traveleth. I was bound down, uh, bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at, the, dismayed at the scene of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table. Watch in the watchtower. Here's the watchman. Now, the watchman. The watchman is illustrating the watchman at the end of the world because all the prophets are identifying the end of the world. So here we're seeing a story about a watchman at the end of the world. And we know, that, we know from Sister White's direct comment that the watchmen of the Millerite times, if nothing else, we know that they were led to produce the, those charts because that's what Habakkuk 2 verse 1 says. The watchmen had a work to do in the Millerite history, but the watchmen in the Millerite history are also to be understood as the watchmen here at the end of the world. Prepare the table and watch in the watchtower. Eat Drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus has the Lord said unto me, Go, said a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. So now, we're going to see what the watchman saw in the Millerite history, and what the watchman will see in the history of the 144,000. You follow the logic? And I haven't demonstrated conclusively at this point that this is a prophecy about Islam. I've only been inferring that. but I've been saying it, but there isn't hard evidence yet. But as we go through the rest of this chapter, we're going to see that this prophecy of doom has to do with Islam. But let's look at a couple places where the watchmen, this isn't all of them, I reduced some of the other references in 
the Bible to the watchman out of these notes because of space. You ought to look at the watchman in the Bible sometime. Take your concordance and as you read it, tell yourself, these watchmen in this verse, this verse, this passage are illustrating the Millerites and the 144,000. Look at it from that point of view and it'll, in, some lights will come on. Notice this one in Ezekiel. And it came to pay, pass at the end of eight days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I've made thee watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning for me. Seven days? Oh. What? Seven days? What's a day? A year. At the end of 2520, the watchmen are raised up. At, but, okay, you might not see that. <laughs> it's there. There, okay. Now Isaiah, I've set watchmen upon the walls of Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that may make of the Lord, keep not silence. There will always be watchmen that are going to raise. And there's passages in Isaiah where he says they're, the watchmen are dumb dogs that will not bark. Okay, there's two types of watchmen in the church in the Millerite history and at the end of the world. There's some watchmen that give the trumpet a certain sound and there's other watchmen that says we will not hearken to the sound of the trumpet. Okay. We're not dealing with that, but, but they're there. This is Habakkuk 2. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say to me and what sh I shall answer when I'm reproved. How many of you were here Monday night when we started this? Raise your hands high. Okay, so, so okay. You, you can put your hands down. Very few of you were here. Let me show you. Let me jump out of this just for a moment. The Protestant do doors closed in 1842. They started to close. Sister White says, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21, in June of 1842. With few exceptions, the Protestant nominations closed their door against Mr. Miller in June of 1842. This chart here, it was produced based upon what we're reading here in Habakkuk. James White and, and the other pioneers, but I like the way James White say, says it, but many of them say the same thing. He says, if you don't believe that this chart was a fulfillment of prophecy, then you've left the original Advent faith. Every one of those Millerites understood that this chart was a fulfillment of prophecy just as much as the papacy receiving the deadly wound was a fulfillment of prophecy. They knew that. They taught it. They say, you don't believe that? You're not an Adventist. That's how firm they were. This chart is called the 1843 chart because it's predicting the end of the world in 1843. But it was produced in May of 1842. It was produced right in here. Okay, May of 1842. And you know what w William Miller says? He says that in all his published articles and all his spoken presentations, he never was dogmatic about the world coming to an end in 1843. He always said, he says this plainly, it's in the notes from Monday night. If all my calculations are correct, he says, then somewhere around 1843 and perhaps even before, the Lord will return. He was never, ever dogmatic, saying it's 1843. But then he says, then he says, in 1842, some of my brethren started putting pressure on me to take the if out of my presentations. And when he says the word if, he puts it in capital letters. He's emphasizing it. And the reason that they told him to take the if out of it is because in 1842, this chart was produced and they were saying to Elder Miller, look at this is our message. It's clearly saying the end of the world in 1843. Let's take the if out of it. Let's stand united on this message. And you know what happened according when Mil William Miller's given this testimony? From that point on, the Protestant churches started their resistance and their attack, calling it a delusion and a fanaticism. So what I want you to see is in 1842, in May of 1842, this chart arrives in fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, a fulfillment of prophecy. And this chart is what closes the door on the Protestants in June of 1842. It's the arrival of this chart that makes the Millerites saying the world is coming to an end in 1843 period. And the Protestants say, now this is delusion. Don't let him back in the church. Okay. So this chart is not simply illustrating the foundational truths. When it arrived in history, 
caused an impact. All right. Pardon me? Yes, verse 1 of Habakkuk 2 says, I will stand on my watch and set me up on the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And reproved means argued with. This was the argument. What I want you to see is, brothers and sisters, after 2001, God's people begin to go back to the foundational truths of Adventism and look at them closely. Why? Because now they started understanding that Islam had arrived back in history. And if you're going to prove that to a Seventh-day Adventist, then you're going to prove it on the foundational truth that the first and second woe is Islam. So the Lord leads his people at the very point in time back to these charts. Now these charts here, now there's a little bit of difference. This was used for those outside of the Millerite movement in that history. Now the Lord is using this inside Adventism to go back to the foundations because in each of these reform movements the foundations are laid right here in the first way mark. They're not laid in the second way mark. They're not laid in the third way mark. They're laid right here in the first way mark. He's taking it back to the foundations but do you know what that means? It means when God's people start investigating these charts again that the door is about to close. That's what happened here. This Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. You know how much these charts are? I mean, maybe you can get them cheaper. We have these printed 20 at a time on this vinyl for people that are using it. If you, I, I use paper ones for a long time, but if you're traveling with them, you want the vinyl, you want, you want the grommets. We sell them for 95 bucks each. And we're not trying to make money off of them. That's just a little bit above what it cost us. And do you know that at 95 bucks each, we're having them print, printed on a regular basis, 20 at a time. People around Adventism around the world now, <laughs> they're looking at these charts. They're looking at these charts like never before. Oh, why? Because they've come back in to, at the very same point in time. Okay? So in Habakkuk 1, the watchman, he says, I will stand on my watch and I'll wait to see what the Lord tells me I need to say in the argument. And what's the argument? Well, we know what the argument is because in the next verse, he tells us what to answer. And he says, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth. That the argument is over these charts. This argument's over the foundational truths that are represented on these charts because now the Lord is leading us back to the old paths. Okay? Next, another watchman from Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17 says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. And also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. The trumpet on these charts that brings the angel down is Islam. So the subject of the watchman in Bible prophecy it's representing the watchman in the Millerite history. It's watch, representing you and I at the end of the world. So back to Isaiah 21. This is what the, the watchman is going to see, what he sees in Isaiah 21. And he saw a chariot with, a, with three horsemen. Is that what it says? With a couple of horsemen. Okay, two horsemen. A chariot of asses and a chariot of camels. Now, the chariot of asses, who do you suppose the Hebrew is there? This is the wild Arabian ass. This is the same thing that's translated as wild man in the prophecy of Ishmael. So this chariot, it's an easy, it's an easy symbol of Islam. He sees two chariots. One is the wild Arabian ass. This is Islam. What's the other chariot? <laughs> Camels. It, would camel be an okay symbol of Arabia? <sighs> okay, so he sees two chariots, asses and camels, and he hearkened diligent which, with much heed and cried, A lion. 
And it's, it's important to take note of, if you would, that when he cries a lion, that it actually says, he cried as a lion crieth. That's the actual Hebrew. It says in the Bible, and he cried a lion. But the Hebrew actually says, he cried as a lion. Have you ever heard that expression anywhere today? How about Revelation 10? When the mighty angel comes down out of heaven with the little book of Daniel open in his hand and he cried as a lion and when he crieth seven thunders uttered their voices. And I was about to write what the seven thunders uttered but I was told write them not. And the seven thunders are teaching the truth. The Millerite history is repeated in the history of the 144,000 and when he cries as a lion here, it's emphasizing that this passage in Isaiah 21 is an illustration of not only the Millerite history, but of the history of Adventism at the end of the world. And the first thing that the Millerites saw were the two chariots of Islam, the fifth and sixth trumpet, because it's that message. Brothers and sisters, that message is the message that empowered the Millerite movement because that is the message that confirmed the year-day principle before the eyes of the world and put the punchline into the prediction of 1843-1844. The year-day principle was confirmed. And the first thing that the Millerites saw was the significance of the role of Islam in Bible prophecy. And then what did they say? That's right here, by the way. This is representing Islam in the understanding of the Millerites. They were predicting the collapse of the Ottoman Empire based upon their understanding of the two horsemen. What's the next thing they said? And, they, and he answered and said unto me, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken into the ground. O oh, my threshing and corn of my floor, that's what, which I've heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. After the prophecy of Islam confirms the year day principle in the Millerite history, then comes the proclamation of the second angel. Notice the next quote, the burden of Duma, the burden of death. Duma is the son of Ishmael. He that calleth out a seer. Seer is Edom and intermarried with the descendants of Ishmael. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, the morning cometh and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. What's it mean? Watchman, what of the night? John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Sister White says this, letters have come to me asking if I have any special light as to the time when probation will close. And I answered that I only, I have only this message to bear, that it is now time to work while the day lasts for the night cometh in which no man can work. The prophecy of Isaiah 21, the hard prophecy, a prophecy that is first identifying the role of Islam in Bible prophecy, is followed by the pronouncement Babylon has fallen when the second angel's message arrived. And the underlying context of the whole work is that probation is about to close. Now you see double there? This is... At the bottom, do you know what, I, what that means by double? This, this, you're not going to find this, I don't think, in any Adventist bookstore. Yeah. You realize in the second angel's message it says Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and in the fourth angel's message it says Babylon has fallen, has fallen. If you take and look closely at the Word of God, you'll find then wh when an expression is repeated two times, it's identifying either the fall of Babylon in the Millerite history or the fall of Babylon at the end of the world. Look at Isaiah 58, 9. According to the Bible, testimony of two or three things is established. If you've ever wondered why it has to be expressed, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, because that's a marker for the second and the fourth angel's message. And in the Bible where you see things repeated twice, watchmen, what are the night? Watchmen, what are the night? Invariably, that expression can be identified as being fulfilled in the history of the second or the history of the fourth angel's message. Notice Isaiah 58, 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the war Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are thou not it, th are thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? 
51.9. Oh, come on. It's on the paper. I may have said 58.9, but it's 51.9 on the paper. That's what I was going by when I opened up. <laughs> All right. Awake, awake. Okay, this is an illustration of the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 17. Awake, awake. Stand up, O Jerusalem. When do we stand up? When do we stand up? According to Ezekiel 37. When do we stand on our feet as a mighty army? When the latter rain, when the breath of life comes into us. Awake, awake. Stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup, trembling and wrung, wrung, wrung them out. Look at Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. From henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised or the unclean. Now, there's, when you see uh, an expression repeated twice in the scriptures, it's a reference to the history of the second or the fourth angel's message, but Brother Lloyd and I were having a discussion right before we started, and I want to throw this in here. It has to do with the watchman. Look at verse 8 of 52. The watchman shall lift up his voice. That's the watchman in the Millerite history, and the watchman at the end of the world. Isaiah 52 8 thy watchmen shall lift up the, the voice with the voice together they shall sing for they shall have different views of different things they're going to see eye to eye the Millerites 300 preachers every one of them used this chart exclusively they saw eye to eye at the end of the world those, those watchmen at the end of the world that finish this work they're going to see eye to eye they're going to be saying the same thing but that's outside the scope of this, these double repetitions. How about verse what's 8 and 9 mean? 11 De Depart ye. Ah, this is a good one. Revelation 52, 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go you out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. That's come out of Babylon, come out of Babylon, depart ye, depart ye, be ye clean. When you see an expression doubled in the scriptures, it's a marker for the second and fourth angel's message. So if you go back to your notes where we just were, right above the close of probation, it says the burden of Duma who is the son of Ishmael. He calleth to me out of Seir, who is someone that intermarried with Ishmael. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? It's identifying that this passage of Scripture is going to be fulfilled in this history here of the second angel's message. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and in this history down here, where the second angel's message is repeated, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. It's the watchman that the burden is based upon the fact their burden is based upon the fact their message is premised upon the truth that probation is about to close. And that's what the Millerites were teaching. And the first, the first part of the Millerite message had to do with the, the two chariots. The chariots of the asses, the chariots of camels. It had to do with Islam in Bible prophecy. And that led into the second angel's message which is Babylon has fallen. Continuing on on page 33 from Isaiah 21. See if we can see that this is a prophecy about Islam. It says, In the forest in Arabia shall you lodge. That's where Islam's from. O you traveling companies of Denanim, Arabians, grandson of Abraham through Keturah, the inhabitants of the land of Tima, descendant of Ishmael, brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled, for they fled from swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. This prophecy is about Islam and the warfare that they bring. Notice what it says about Islam here. For thus has the Lord said unto me, within a year, according to the years of a hireling. Now what's that mean? I don't know if I really understand what that means, but what it means to me is this. If I hire you to work for me for a year, if we agree I'm going to give you $1,000 and you're going to work for me for one year, if I'm a rich guy and i got lots of people working for me, I may not remember that you started to work for me on March 1st, but you will. A hireling knows when the year's work that he's contracted for is over. He counts the day. It's a very specific point in time. The guy that hired him may not have paid attention to it, but you know. You know if you've agreed to work 
when that's over. It says, For thus the Lord has said unto me, With a year according to the years of a hireling. This prophecy about Islam has a very specific timing to it. Within that year it says, All the glory of Qadar, and Qadar is the son of Ishmael, shall fail. And the residue of the number of archers, the warriors of Islam, the mighty men of the children of Qadar, shall be diminished, which is just exactly what happened right on time, right on schedule, on August 11th, 1840. The warriors of Islam were restrained. And this is what Isaiah 21 is speaking about. The first thing, the first thing that empowers the message of the Millerites, the watchmen of the Millerites, what they saw first was the message of Islam. And it led to the second angel's message, Babylon has fallen. And their message was premised upon the close of probation. Now the next chapter will probably bring this into understanding for you. Down at the bottom of page 33, beginning verse 1 of Isaiah 22, it says, and there is no, there is no break between Isaiah 21 and 22 except what the translators put in there with the chapters. This is the same vision. It says, What aileth thee now? Thou art going up, up to the housetops. Housetops are a roof. Why do people go on the housetops in the days of Isaiah? Pardon me? Almost. Pardon me? You go up on the housetops when you want to worship the stars and the sun and the moon. Okay. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly going, gone up on the housetops? Notice what the, the definition of this. A roof by analogy. The top of an altar. Thou that art full of stirs. A tumultuous city. A joyous city. Thy slain men are not slain with the sword nor dead in battle. All thy rulers are fled together. They are bound by the archers. All that are found in thee are bound together which have fled from afar. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah 21 is saying that the watchmen of the Millerite history, they recognize the first and second woe. They recognize the prophecy of Islam. That's what empowered their entire message. Their message is premised upon the close of human probation and after the message of Islam comes into be the fulfillment here in 1840 and that message is rejected then the proclamation Babylon has fallen has fallen. After that history comes the crisis in the parable of the ten virgins. This is where the foolish virgins come and knock on the door but find no entrance. October 22nd 1844 this is where the door closes and it's in a character where crisis is demonstrated not developed. That's the history of the Millerite. Isaiah 22 is a crisis and the city that's being described in Isaiah 22 is Jerusalem and Jerusalem's in a crisis and in Isaiah 22 there's two classes of worshipers that are going to be described in this crisis time. Of course what we're saying is that in this history here that's repeating the Millerite history that we will be required to understand these same chariots of Islam and it will precede the pronouncement that is Babylon has fallen and it will be premised upon the thought that probation is about to close and it will lead to the crisis where the door closes where you and I if we're alive demonstrate whether we've prepared a character for the seal of God or the mark of the beast and we, we can show that to you as we go down through therefore said I look away from me I will weep bitterly Isaiah is becoming part of this prophecy labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people what's the daughter or son of his people in Bible prophecy it's the remnant it's the final offspring it's God's people at the end of the world this is the daughter of the church the last church for it is a day of trouble of tre and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and crying to the mountains. Isaiah in this crisis, which is the crisis of Adventism today. In Adventism today, when we should be mourning and weeping, we're celebrating. And Isaiah in this prophecy, he's mourning and weeping. And notice what Sister White says in Testimonies, Volume 3, page 267. 
Who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and who murmur in their hearts if not openly against those who would reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and, and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No indeed. Unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and in holding up the hands of sinners in Zion, they will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of the wicked represented by the work of the five men bearing the slaughter weapons. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost represented by a mark by the man in linen are those that what? Sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the church. Their love for purity and the, uh, the honor and glory of God is such and they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. Read the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. And this is where Isaiah is at in Isaiah 22. There's a joyous city. It's went up on the housetops. It's worshiping the sun. It's partying down. And all Isaiah can do is weep and mourn. And this is the crisis at the end of the Millerite history. And this is the crisis at the end of our history. We'll show you that as we proceed. And Elam, back to Isaiah 22, bear the quivers with chariots of men and horsemen, and Kerr uncovered the shield. And it shall come to pass that the choicest valleys shall be full of chariots, and the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah. And now didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. This is a crisis. You have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that there are many. And you've gathered together the waters of the lower pool. And you've numbered the houses of Jerusalem and the houses have you broken down to fortify the wall. You've made also a ditch between two walls for the water of the old pool. But you have not looked unto the maker thereof. Neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. You're looking at the temple. But you're not looking at the one that's raised the temple. And in that day, what day? Now Isaiah is going to be clear about what day this is. And in that day, in that crisis, in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. What day are God's people called to weeping and mourning and girding with sackcloth? Day of atonement. Huh. When did, day of, when did the day of atonement begin? Right here. This is where the Millerites came to. The Millerites first, they see Islam, the first and second wall. This is what the watchmen see first in Millerite history. This produces the empowerment of a message that's rejected by the Protestants, which produces the next thing that's described in the prophecy, the pronouncement that Babylon has fallen. And it leads right into Isaiah 22, which is the Day of Atonement. But that history is repeated. What the watchmen here at the end of the world have to see they're going to have to see the same two chariots. The same two. They don't have to see the third wall. They have to see the first and the second wall. Because the first and the second wall is what defines the third wall. We have to see the same thing. And we have to see it off those charts. We have to understand that this is a foundational truth. And shortly thereafter, this arrives on September 11, 2001. That's Revelation 18, verse 1. That's the, the story of Islam. What's verse 2 say? What's verse 2 of Isaiah, or of Revelation 18? And he cried with a loud voice, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Same story, same sequence. And it leads to right here where the door closes. Alright? Now maybe you don't think... Maybe you don't think this is the Day of Atonement. And in that day the Lord called... The Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and girdiness with sackcloth and behold joy, gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. He's saying that in the day of atonement there's one class in Adventism represented by Isaiah that are weeping and mourning and another class in Adventism that, <coughs> excuse me, that are celebrating. Notice the next verse. And it was revealed in Isaiah's ears. It was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts. 
Now in the King James it says purged. But I have the Hebrew meaning in there. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged. Or shall find no atonement from you till you die. Saith the Lord God of hosts. That's a day of atonement we're talking about. Thus saith the Lord God. Now we're gonna, he's going to give us a parable. Now there's going to be added to this story. He's going to give us the story of two individuals. Shebna, who is the leader, who's a treasurer. And I like saying here, I probably shouldn't say it anymore because it's recorded on other ta or on other sorry, on other presentations. It might sound a little bit redundant. But treasures in the word of God don't get a good rap. All right. Shebna treasure, was in the treasury in the temple and they had to throw him out and clean the room he was in. What about Judas? Here's another treasurer. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, get thee unto this treasure, even unto Shebna, to grow, which is over the house, and say, what hast thou here? Now this is the, the one that's the head of Jerusalem, one of the leaders. What hast thou here? And whom thou, hast thou here? That thou hast hewed thee out of out a sepulchre here, as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. Sennacherib's coming to Jerusalem in this story. He's going to destroy Jerusalem. And this leader, Shebna, what's he doing? He's fixing himself a fancy grave. And do you know that if you get into the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Dictionary <clears throat> that they discovered in Jerusalem Shebna's grave. And in the, I think it's in the museum in London, they actually have Shebna's seal that was on the gravestone. And it's, it's got a picture of it in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. I mean, how many, how many actual characters in the Bible have they actually found a historical you know, marker of. And what is the marker of? It's a marker of a grave. It's a marker of death. Because in a crisis, this man, the treasurer, all he was doing was worried about his self-glory when he should have been trying to lead the people into the right position with the Lord. Okay? There's more to say about that, but let's read on. Thou hast hewed thee out a sepulchre here, as if he hewed him, him out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There thou shalt die. He was supposed to be weeping and mourning with sackcloth in the day of atonement, in the crisis. But he was celebrating and building him a fancy grave. And the Lord says he's surely going to violently throw him into a far country. This is a Laodicean. You know where it says the Laodiceans are going to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord? You know what that means, don't you? It doesn't mean vomit. It means projectile vomit. He's going to spew them out of the mouth of the Lord and he's going to take Shebna and violently throw him out. Now I'm saying he's Laodicea because in a moment we're going to show that the other character here is definitely Philadelphia. And Sister White says twice that the Laodiceans are foolish virgins. And the history of the Millerites and the history of Adventism is the history of the parable of the ten virgins. So if the Laodiceans are the foolish virgins... Who are the wise virgins? The Philadelphians. A lot of people in Adventism don't want to hear that, but it's true. Continue on. So then now, Revelation 3.16, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy, my mouth. And there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. This is a leader, Shebna. He's over the house of the Lord in a crisis. And the promise is, is that he's going to be taken from his station. What does Sister White say? Last day events, 204-205. He will raise up from among the common people, men and women, to do his work, even as of old. He called fishermen to be his disciples. There will soon be an awakening that will surprise many. Those who do not realize the necessity of what, it is to be, what is to be done will be passed 
by and heavenly messengers will work with those who are called the common people fitting them to carry the truth to many places. In the last solemn work few great men will be engaged. God will work a work in our day that but few anticipate. He will raise up and exalt among us those who are taught rather by the unction of his Holy Spirit than by the outward training of scientific institutions. These facilities are not to be despised or condemned. They are ordained of God but they can furnish only exterior qualifications. God will manifest that he is not dependent on learned self-important mortals to souls that are seeking earnestly seeking for light and that accept with gladness every way of ray of divine illumination from his holy word to such alone will be, light will be given it is through these souls that God will reveal the, that light and power which will lighten the whole earth with his glory it is discipline of the spirit cleanness of heart and thought that is needed this of, is of more value than brilliant talent tact and, or knowledge an ordinary mind trained to obey thus saith the Lord is better qualified for God's work than are those who have capabilities but do not employ them rightly the laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal declaring the words which God gives them in the Christ in the crisis go to Isaiah 28 brothers and sisters Isaiah 28 verse 11 says this Isaiah is speaking about the end of the world and Isaiah is speaking about the latter rain because he's going to speak about the refreshing in a great controversy 611 sister white says the refreshing is the latter rain now in Isaiah 28 verse 11 it says for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people with another tongue, with stammering lips, at the end of the world he will speak to his people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet, they would not hear. When it comes to the latter rain time period, it won't be those that have the perfect ability to speak. It's going to be those with stammering lips that are called from the common walks of life because in the crisis that's confronting the world and the church today, Shebna represents those that are wrapped up in their self-glorification and are about to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord at the Sunday Law. And that is a common topic of prophecy. Back to the notes, bottom of the page 35, continuing on. In Isaiah 22 it says, And it shall come to pass in that day. In what day? The day of atonement in the crisis that we're in today that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hands. There's going to be a replacement. And what I'm saying is, Shebna that gets thrown into the country that he represents Laodicea, the foolish virgins in Adventism today. And they're about to be replaced with Hilkiah. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now notice what it says about him. And the key of the house of David. There's only one other place that this is identified in God's word. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne in his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even to all the vessels of flagons. Brothers and sisters, he represents a Philadelphian. And he's contrasted with a Laodicean. And it's right here for the Millerites that the door closed and 49,950 Millerites continued to pray into the holy place and Satan answered their prayer. And only 50 moved into the most holy place with Christ. And that's repeated when the parable of the ten virgins is accomplished in Adventism in the very near future. And at that point, our door closes at the Sunday law and it will be made manifest whether we're representing one or the other of these two individuals. That in a crisis, how did we respond? Now you know what's interesting, if you get your Seventh-day Adventist Bible Dictionary, um, Hilkiah here, they found an, a historical artifact 
of his. Also, they even have a picture of it in the dictionary. And I mean, there just isn't that many characters in the Bible that they found historical artifacts that they can say this is from that character of Bible history. You know what they found of Hilkiah? They found the instrument that he used to put the official seal on the dark document. He represents those people that are sealed. What they found of Shebna was his name on a grave. <laughs> He'd made a covenant with death. He receives the mark of the beast, but Hilkiah, he's those that are get sealed. And this story in Isaiah 21 and 22, this is the story of the Millerites, this is the story of the 144,000. And brothers and sisters, you can't get away from the fact that the watchmen of the Millerites, what they saw first was the role of Islam in Bible prophecy, and it brought about the closing of the doors that produced the next step, which was Babylon has fallen, which led to the next step where the crisis illustrated what class of worshiper they really were. Were they a foolish virgin, a Laodicean, or were they a wise virgin, a Philadelphian? And this history is repeated today. And what Adventists are confronted with today is are we going to open our minds to the fact that Islam has a role in Bible prophecy? And it's built upon the foundational truths. And it's the third war, the seventh trumpet. But they will not hearken to the sound of the trumpet. It's part of the controversy, the shaking of walking in the old past. And when we walk in the old past, what do we find? We find the rest. We find the refreshing. Here we are today. We see the two chariots. The chariots of asses, the chariots of horse, horses. And we're about to the point where the divine pronouncement is Babylon has fallen, which is then and thereafter followed by the closing of the door where we demonstrate whether we're Hilkiah or Shebna. And it's wake-up time in Adventism because the Millerite history is repeating to the very letter and the testing time of the sealing of the 144,000 has begun and most Adventists are sleeping on. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we wish that you'd awaken us to our responsibility of being a watchman upon the walls of Zion, of being a Nehemiah, a Nehemiah that gets on the wall with his work of his work tool in one hand and his weapon of war in the other, that we be about our business of finishing this work and defending the truth that's, that you're revealing at this time, that Jerusalem can be built again and that we can go home with you soon. But we are in a, a sleeping condition. All the virgins, both wise and foolish, slept. But it's clear that the cry that the bridegroom is coming is now being sounded. Awaken us, Lord. Help us to understand your voice through all this. Help us to receive the golden oil that's coming down through these pipes. Help us eat the bread of life that it might change us into your image, that it might transform us, that it might empower us. We thank you for this week of meetings. Thank you for being with us today, and we ask for your continued presence throughout the next presentation. In Jesus' name, amen.